Hope everybody is doing well this morning. It is good to see you. I want to invite you to turn with me back to the book of Ruth. Back to the book. We began this book last week, and so as we study the book of Ruth together, we're going to see more and more starting today how God amazingly provides for his people, how faithfully he loves his people. People. We're going to read a short passage today, and so we're going to begin in verse 8. If you have that, go ahead and stand with me. If you do not have a Bible with you, you can read along off the screen with us. You read along silently. I will read along aloud this morning. This is Ruth chapter 1, starting in verse 6. Starting in verse 6. Then she, that's Naomi, arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the land of Moab, for she had heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people to give them food. So she departed from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on their way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, Go, return, each of you, to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. May the Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. And then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. But they said to her, No, we will surely return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return, my daughters. Why should you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Return, my daughters, go for I am too old to have a husband. If I said I have hope, if I should even have a husband tonight and also bear sons, would you therefore wait until they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is harder for me than for you, for the hand of the Lord has gone against me. And they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law but Ruth clung to her. And then she said, Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said to her, Do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, your God, my God. And where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me, and worse, if anything but death parts you and me. And when she saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. We thank you that your word does not return to you void, but accomplishes the purpose for which you sent it. And so, Lord, we ask today that you would do that. Lord, we lift up our voices with people all over this nation today. We pray for those that are in the Carolinas that are facing uh, great difficulty with the hurricane. We ask for safety for them, Lord. We ask that you would get relief efforts there. We ask that you would take care of them. But Lord, we also pray for our own hearts today. And just as we sang a few moments ago, Lord, even as Paul prayed for the Ephesians, we ask that you would give us understanding in knowing you that you would enlighten the eyes of our heart so that we may know the hope to which you have called us, the riches of the glory of your inheritance in the saints and what is the surpassing greatness of your power toward those of us who believe even this same power that raised Jesus from the grave. And we ask for that this morning trusting you for it in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. C.S. Lewis wrote the Chronicles of Narnia. It's not the only thing that he's written, but it's probably some of the most well-known things that he's written. And so I think one of my favorite characters in the Chronicles of Narnia books is a character called Reepicheep. I don't know. Anybody know who Reepicheep is? And so, Reepicheep is great. If you've not read the Chronicles of Narnia books, they're short, they're easy reads, they are fun, they're enjoyable, and he wrote them on purpose so that you can read them to people of all ages and they would hear about Christ 
so that when they heard about Christ later on, they go, oh, this is just like what this person did. Ah, oh, that's just like Edmund's sin. I'm a sinner. And so uh, it, it wrote for that purpose. Reba Cheap is one of the most interesting characters in all of the books. He is noble. He is fierce to a fault. You did not make fun of him or disparage his honor. He would come after you. And so he was uh, just an interesting, interesting character. But one of the most interesting things about him was this. Reba Cheap is a rat. It's a mouse? Oh, he's a rat. So we're talking small, little, itty-bitty type things. That's my daughter, don't worry. She corrects me and fact-checks me all the time during our sermons. Itty-bitty. You know, not necessarily the cutest thing in the world. Mouse. And yet what you find in Reaper Cheap is one of the most loyal characters you could ever hope to find in any type of literature. Not only does he stand up for his own honor, but also the honor of the Pevensies, the one these stories are about. In fact, when their cousin Eustace, his name is Eustace Scrub, and C.S. Lewis said he almost deserved that name. And so just a awful terrible, horrible excuse for a kid. I mean, just horrible. Comes and is making fun of them, making fun of Aslan, making fun of Reaper Cheap. Reaper Cheap stands up to defend them, and Reaper Cheap and Eustace have some of these run-ins very often. But, but what's interesting in the story, and this is the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, by the way, if you want to read this one, is simply this. When Eustace gets turned into a dragon... And I don't mean like cute little dragon. Oh, look at him. We're talking big wings, fire-breathing terror. And everybody else doesn't want anything to do with him, even after they know that that's Eustace. Who's staying up at night talking with him? Who's telling him stories? Who's coming close when nobody else wants to get close? Reap it, Loyal, devoted friend. I think we all want that. We all want a friendship like that, that somebody who is loyal and devoted to us, that even when we turn into dragons, and sometimes we do, right? There are days that we are fire-breathing terrors. We want them to continue to be around. We want them to continue to hold on to us. We want them to continue to be with us and not say, forget you, I'm out of here. One of the things that we see in our story today is something actually quite a bit different than what we expect to see, and it sets up how we need to see the rest of the book. This story today is not merely about, wow, look at Ruth, the ultimate friend, be an ultimate friend like Ruth. That's normally how this is shared. That's not really, I think, the main thrust of the story. The main thrust of the story is this. Look at the kindness of God, who he provided for Naomi, who thought for certain, my life is over, my life is done, he doesn't love me anymore, everything's gone. And God had already continually been providing his kindness to Naomi through Ruth. Yes, she is a a love and a friendship we should seek to emulate, but it is much more than that. God provides all of his blessings for Naomi through Ruth. And one of the things that we're going to learn today is this. God, in his kindness that continues to extend toward us, his devoted kindness that he gives to us, has provided that same relationship for each one of us in Christ, through whom all of God's blessings come to us. Let's take a look at this passage. Three things we're going to see today. If you're taking notes, I want to tell you right up front, the notes that you have in your bulletin are actually going to be our applications today. Okay? Those are our applications today. So our outline is actually not in your bulletin, and I ask your forgiveness for that. I want to give that to you really, really quickly. There are three things. They all start with the same three words. God provides kindness. Those are the three words that start off all of them. Three points today. God provides kindness. One, that helps in time of need. 
I want you to take a look at the passage here with me. God provides kindness that helps in time of need. And you can see it up there on the, the screen with me. Notice Naomi speaking with her daughters-in-law, starting in verse 8. Go, may the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with me. Now, if you circle or underline or highlight in your Bibles, which I encourage you to do, I want you to underline, circle that word, kindly. It's not a word that we draw a lot of attention to. I used to have a friend that I went to seminary with that said, we read the word of God much too quickly, much too fast, and we we blow right by that word. That word that says kindly there simply is the word, the root word is hesed. We introduced this last week. Sometimes that's translated as love. Sometimes that's translated as mercy. Sometimes it's translated as kindness. Sometimes it's translated as loving kindness. Sometimes it's translated faithful love. Sometimes it's translated unfailing love. Sometimes it's it's just translated the word love. And this is part of God's character. And Naomi was recognizing that both Ruth and Orpah had dealt kindly, had dealt with Hesed, with her and with the dead. God had provided kindness for Naomi, even in the midst of this utter tragedy. God had provided this kindness that she needed somebody to be there with her to walk with her through this grief walk with her through this hardship god had provided that for her and unfortunately as many of us do when we face times of great grief great difficulty we overlook those things we miss how god has provided for us when we face real significant difficulties, we have tragedies that strike, especially here in Oklahoma, like tornadoes that rake through our state, or when we think about 9-11 that happened 17 years ago, just this past week. One of the things that immediately comes to mind is the way people pull together and help out. And we all see that and we know that that is a thing of beauty because it doesn't matter whether the person is a a believer in Christ or not or if they believe in a completely different other religion or or, or whatever. It doesn't matter if they're what color they are, what what race they are, it doesn't matter what state they're from. If they hear about these things, they want to send help. And we all recognize kindness like that. And we all recognize that kindness like that is a good thing. It doesn't mean that everybody's saved, but it is a good thing, and that should characterize us, characterize our society. When people are hurting and when loved ones pass away, we gather around them. Now, why is that? How does that happen? How does everybody know to do that? In fact, it seems kind of strange to us that a week prior, let's say to uh, some sort of tragedy, you know, the, the tornadoes raking through here, a week prior to that, some of those same people that we could be helping, we could cut off in traffic, and they could honk at us and yell at us, and we wouldn't think a thing about it. And yet, the day of the tragedy, we're like, oh, we are all Oklahomans. We are here together. There is kindness. Where before, there was something else going on. What in the world explains that? Well, here's why that happens. You and I are created in the image of God. That image is fractured because of the fall. Adam and Eve sinned, and therefore you and I and all of their ancestors are, are, are now sinners. We have all sinned. We are sinners by birth. We're sinners by choice. The image of God in us has been fractured, but it is not gone. That's why we are not surprised when anybody people on the other side of the political aisle than us, people of other religions, people that don't believe anything. They say, I, I don't believe anything of what you're preaching this morning, but I think we should help one another. That's why all of us recognize kindness like this. This is a good thing. We should help one another. How does that happen? The image of God in us. This is God's character. This is what God is like. This is how God treats his creation. This is how God treats his people. He is kind, faithful, loving, merciful, gracious, unfailing in his love for his people. And when we see that in others, we immediately are attracted to that. We are immediately attracted to that. In fact, we find out that part of the fruit the Spirit produces in us is that kindness 
love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. This is one of the things he produces in us. So that it's not just an exterior action where we're like, oh, hey, how are you? It's nice to see you. And we put on the face and everything's great. Uh, that's, that's not it. It's that we actually love and care for them and we are devoted inside and in our actions outside to them. We are devoted, faithful to one another. Orpah, Naomi, were showing this to Ruth and Ruth had seen this. Ruth asked for God's blessing on them. God had provided for Ruth, or Naomi. God had already begun, even in the midst of tragedy, even in the midst of her, I can't believe this is happening. God must hate me. I don't know what's going on. God's kindness was still there. And maybe that's where you are this morning. You are in the midst of something that is just, just horrible. You are in the midst of something just crashing down on you. You are in the midst of the trial, unlike anything else that you have faced in your life. And what I want to share with you is this. God is here with you, and his kindness is toward you now we should also because we are recipients of that kindness share that same kindness with one another never discount what your kindness can do never discount that you know one of the things about being a preacher, if you're a teacher, you face this as well. If you're a Sunday school teacher, you face this as well. So teachers, back me up on this. Even school teachers, especially, especially, back me up on this. You're teaching, and you're teaching, and you're teaching, and you get to the end of the day, and you're like, I really hope somebody got some of that. Anybody else felt that? I really hope somebody's learning something. I'm working really hard, okay? That same feeling, by the way, you never get over. I mean, you never do. That same feeling is there with kindness. I really hope this is conveying. I really hope this is making a difference. August 31st of 1990, you all are familiar with that date. Uh, I've been here long enough now, you all know that date. My dad passed away. I don't remember a lot from that day, I gotta be honest, in that weekend. There are a few things I remember, but there's one thing I remember more clearly than just about anything else, and it's simply this. Many of you all know Dan and Yvonne Hatfield, and so they've been here, uh, they might be here today. I don't know if they're here today or not, and so, uh, but they, they've moved up to Edmond to, to be near their daughter. Uh, they had a son named David. He and I were the same age we grew up here in this church David spent that whole weekend around me devoted faithful kindness well, what did he do pastor what did he say I mean how did he how did he do that how did he make things better he didn't he was just there with me we went and did stuff together he spent time with me. He took me to the game. Uh, he wasn't even a, a, a student at Norman High. I mean, he was a student at Noble High School. Uh, he took me to the Norman High School football game. He took me and we did stuff that Saturday. And we spent time together. Doing what? I don't remember. I just remember we were together. I remember driving down the road, and I remember the sun shining. I remember the song on the radio. If you want to come up to me, I'll tell you what song it was after we're the sermon here. I can tell you the song that was on the radio. I remember sitting, he's driving, and I remember the Lord impressing very much on my heart, you're going to be okay. This kindness of my friend helped me see this. Life was going to go on. It was bad. It was hard. And life will go on. You will be okay. You know what? David never knew that. It was a life-changing experience, quite honestly, for me. He never knew that. Not until about a handful of years ago. I was in Ponca. He was living in, Pong, uh, in Stillwater. I went down and got to share with him. I said, thank you so much for spending that day with me. I don't, I don't even know if he remembered. I mean, just quite honestly, I think he remembered. Oh, yeah, I remember being with you that weekend. He didn't necessarily realize all that God was doing through his kindness at a time when I was in deep need. Don't discount your kindness toward others when they are in need. Even small gestures, even things where I don't even know what to say, I don't know what to do. Your kindness at times like that, God 
can use that to absolutely change people's lives. God provided kindness to help Naomi in time of dire need. He can do that for us as well. God provides kindness as well, number two, that helps when people feel helpless. This is what Naomi felt. Take a look back at your scripture here with me. Naomi had gone through something absolutely devastating, but it's more devastating in her day even than it would be in our day. Let me explain. Take a look here in the story with me. In that day in society, your husband and your sons were the ones that were going to take care of you. Your family were going to take care of you. And everybody she had invested in, everybody she had given up her life for so they could benefit, everybody she had said, I'm setting aside my desires, my wants, my needs, my hopes so that they may benefit, are now gone. And in many ways, as one pastor said, her life is, especially in her own opinion, every bit the definition of a failure. Everybody's gone. Look at her argument that she shares with her daughters in verse 11. Return, my daughters. Why should you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that you may have husbands? This assumes the the law of uh, leveret marriage. And so real quickly, Old Testament provided a case for, just in case, you know, a a person and a a husband and a wife, husband passes away, what do they do with that wife? The family helps take care of that wife, and then the next youngest son actually marries that wife. This is then they could have multiple wives, and uh, but that's what they were supposed to do, and raise up a son, a child, for the name of his brother. The family was to take care of that. Now we think of that today and we're thinking, ooh, that's gross. But what that meant in their society was this, the family was going to take care of you. Why? Because remember, your husband in this day, your sons, these were protection, these were provisions, this was the way you were taken care of. And the family didn't go, man, sorry, tough for you, I can't believe it. Well, see ya, and then go home. They took care of her and provided for her. But Naomi, Naomi doesn't have any more sons. Maybe she's alluding to the fact that she couldn't have any more. I don't know. I don't, does not tell her what age that is. Have I yet sons in my womb that you may have husbands? Return. I'm too old to have a husband. I'm too old to marry. And remember playing the game Let's Pretend when you were little? Hey, let's pretend this. Let's let's pretend that this is the situation. And that's what she does next. She plays a let's pretend. If I should have hope, translation, let's pretend. If I should have a husband tonight, I get married tonight, and I get pregnant tonight with sons, would you wait for them to be grown? At this time, Orpah and Naomi, probably about 20 years old. That's what we're guessing. We don't really know. Again, just the age they would marry and how old they would be at this point. No, they would be 40 by the time those boys were grown. Would they wait? No, that's not right for them. That's not good for them. Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters. And then notice the end of verse 13. This is where you see that Naomi had given in to despair. It's harder for you than for me. Excuse me, it's harder for me than for you. For the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. It's harder for me. You can remarry. You can have husbands. You can have a life again. You can have children and sons and daughters and have joy again. The hand of the Lord is against me. I don't have that anymore. My life is over. Have you been in a place where you felt that? You felt like life was over? You felt that everything was gone? Everything that you had fought for and lived for was just out from under you? God, in his kindness, reaches out for you even now, even here. It would be wrong for us not to recognize that. That he has provided friends, he's provided family, he's provided people that reach out to us, he's provided a church family, he's provided other friends around us in his kindness toward us, even at times like this. 
even here, God has provided. Maybe you're feeling helpless and hopeless like Naomi is right now. God stands ready to help. You see, there is an image of God that really probably draws more from Zeus than it does from the God of the Bible. And that's this. God loves you if you're good. God doesn't love you if you're bad. Do good and everything will be fine and he will leave you alone, thank goodness. If you don't, lighten bolts. God, although holy and just, rightly holding us accountable for our sin, also is loving and gracious and kind. Truth and love are not enemies. Holiness and love meet together on the cross. We're going to hear about that here in just a moment. God stands ready to help when you face times of need. In fact, when you take a look throughout the Old Testament, in fact, even in, I think it's Zephaniah, God calls out to his people, my people, they, they haven't inquired of me. They're facing all these difficulties. They haven't asked me. They haven't sought me. And the implication of that is he wants us to. When we face these trials, he wants us to seek him. He wants us to cry out to him. I remember when I was growing older, when I was little, my dad would love to help, and I'd cry out, Dad, help me, and he'd pick me up, and, you know, I was a little little at this point, and then I grew older, and I was like, ah, I didn't, don't want to do that anymore. I'm the big kid. I don't need to do that anymore. I remember one of the big things for me when I I wanted wanted Dad to lift me up is we'd go to McDonald's on Fridays. We'd go out to eat on Fridays at our, our house, and so we'd go somewhere to get a burger, and I was small enough, I couldn't see over the counter. That's just how big I was. And so I was really little. So I wanted my dad to lift me up so I could see over the counter. Because I gotta be honest, I had never reached that tight. I had no idea what was on the counter. It's a cash register. It was boring as all get out. But I mean, it was amazing when you're that small and you just can't see. Dad, lift me up. Now I get taller, now I get bigger. Dad, I don't want that anymore. And we have this image of, oh, I don't really want you to do that anymore. That's just silly. That's just childish. And, and sometimes we carry that into our relationship with the Lord. And my view on that changed dramatically when I began to have kids. Because when I began to have kids, I began to recognize it doesn't matter if they are this tall, it doesn't matter if they are this tall, and my, my oldest son is getting to be about that height, it seems like, I will drop everything to help the moment that they ask. I would drop anything to go help the moment that they ask. God, in his kindness toward you, stands ready to help you even now in your time of need. But this also reminds us, again, don't ever discount your kindness when people have needs. Again, school teachers, thank you so much for what you do. Thank you for investing in our future. Thank you for being there for those students, each you know, different ones at different times during the year. They're crying. They're having difficulty. You sit and you don't get lunch because you talk with them and you want to see how they're doing. You invest in them. You have no idea what that kindness is doing for that child. Thank you so much. You have no idea the way God can use that kindness to point children toward himself, even though you can't openly share the gospel where you are. But you can share his kindness. And you're sharing his love. Thank you. Thank you. Thirdly, I want to, real quickly, God provides kindness that stays with others, excuse me, stays when others turn back. God provides kindness that stays when others turn back. Most famous part of the story here. Go back. Your sister's gone back. Why don't you go back? And then Ruth said some of the most famous lines in all of literature, much less scripture. Don't urge me to turn back from following you. In fact, literally, if you want to read this literally, it is simply going to say, where you go, I go. Where you stay, I stay. Your people, my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, 
I die, there I'll be buried. This is what she's saying. Committing herself completely in this faithful love to Naomi. Ruth is the tangible picture of God's kindness to Naomi in this passage. Ruth is the one through whom all of God's blessings are going to come to Naomi. And she already had Ruth with her, even through all of these difficulties. God was blessing her through Ruth before she ever even realized it. This has said, this faithful love that God gives to us and that we should give to others, it's costly. It was, for, it was for, for Ruth here. I want you to take a look at the implication of this. You could go back. You could have husbands. You could have a family. I can't. This is what Naomi is saying. The implication, the idea behind that is, if you go with me, we don't know how we're going to eat. We don't know what's expecting, what's, 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 what's ahead of us. We don't know if you will ever get married again. And in faithfulness to her family. Ruth says, I'm staying with you. Orpah often gets a bad rap, but it's often overlooked the fact that she was willing to stay. She didn't. She ended up kissing her mother-in-law. That's a symbol of goodbye there and leaving and going back. Ruth chose to stay here. One pastor brought it up. Each of these were free choices on the part of both of them. And it reminded this pastor of the two thieves on the cross. One of them was saved that none may despair, but only one that none may presume. Orpah headed back to her people, her gods. Ruth headed with her, not knowing what was ahead not knowing if she would be married again. Not knowing, but knowing that this is what God had called her to do. Kindness is costly. It costs the Lord. It will cost us as well. But it is also absolutely right. And it is absolutely what our hearts need. The greatest picture of this costly kindness. It's not Ruth, though. It's what God has done for you. You see, Ruth is not just a picture to say, wow, look at that. She's someone that points ahead to somebody greater. Just like all of God's blessings came to Naomi through Ruth, all of God's blessings come to you through Jesus Christ. In fact, 2 Corinthians 1 tells us all of God's promises are yes in Him, in Christ. Just as all of God's blessings came to Naomi through Ruth, all of God's blessings come to us through Christ. Just like we, Ruth, promised never to leave Naomi. We have a Savior who has promised never to leave us nor forsake us. And just like God gave Ruth to Naomi, and he gave her more than she could ever have imagined in Ruth, we serve a God who's given us himself, and Scripture himself says he's given us, or he can give us far beyond what we can ask or even Think in him. How is all this possible? You see, God provided for our greatest need. Our greatest need is not the situation that's on our hearts right now, today. Our greatest need is the fact that all of us are alienated from God. That's why God feels so distant, by the way. Our sin. We have chose to go our own way in rejection of him. And because of that, all of us are guilty. Every last one of us. We're sinners by birth and sinners by choice. And it would make sense to us in our logical thinking, well, I've got to make up for that. I've got to fix that. But that's not God's answer. In fact, God's answer is something very, very different. God's answer is he will fix this by his faithful, loving 
kindness. And that's exactly what he did. God, in his kindness toward you and me, even though we had rejected him and did not want him, sent Christ for us to redeem us, rescue us. How did that work? He paid for your sin on the cross. He lived the perfect life you could not live on your behalf so that his righteousness could be counted toward you, your sin taken from you and placed upon Christ on the cross and judged forever so that we would be right with him not because of us not because of what we do not because of how religious we are but because of his kindness and what he has done for us and so i ask you this morning have you ever embraced the lord's kindness toward you in christ jesus we look at our applications this is our first application we should continually return to god the source of our blessing have you ever turned back to god this is the biblical concept of repentance repentance as we said last week is not a matter of so many tears it's not a matter of just so much stuff we've got to work up in us or oh i've got to feel sorry enough it's a matter of turning I was going one direction, now I want to follow the Lord. It does not mean perfection. It does mean direction. Lord, I don't want to go that direction of sin anymore. I want to follow you. Help me to follow you. That change of heart is the very essence of repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus, will you do for me what I cannot do for myself? Trusting in him, turning back to God. Have you trusted him? Believer, you who have trusted him as your Lord and your Savior, I want to encourage you. Push into his kindness and love. Find those things that stir those affections, that remind you of God's kindness and love towards you. Spending time with him in his word. Spending time reading books that remind you of him and what he's done for you in Christ. Listening to music that praises and honors God because of what he's done for us in Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you. Find those things. Press in to the Lord here. Follow him. Press into these things that remind you of his kindness because here's one of my biggest fears this is simply an opinion so i will simply put it forward as that i think one of the reasons we are so timid in sharing christ is that so often we are so distant from recognizing god's kindness toward us we assume the kindness we don't revel in it We don't remain in it. We don't see it day after day after day after day. And eventually that takes its toll and we begin to take what God has done for us in Christ for granted. And then we begun to become cold in our love toward him and cold in any type of evangelistic fervor. Press in, believer, to those things, to the Lord, with those things that stir your affections for this. Number two, we need to show God's love, not simply make considerate plans. Naomi had made very considerate plans for her daughters-in-law. You can't marry if you go with me. You're probably not going to marry. You can go home and marry. Go home, marry. Have families, be happy. These were considerate plans. What was the problem with that? That wasn't God's will. How do we know that wasn't God's will? Well, it wasn't God's will because uh, anytime somebody advocates something that turns people away from God, that's not his will. God's will is for us to love him first and foremost, love other people, and to make disciples as believers. Naomi's uh, admission, go back to your people. Notice verse 15, go back to your own God. We can act in ways that are logical, well thought through. Those are important, but that doesn't always mean this is God's will. One of the things that will always be involved in God's will is kindness has said this devotedness to one another which leads us to the last point and simply this and it's there on the screen we should treat one another with loving kindness instead of polite action we can be really polite if i can put this in a church context orpah's answer to naomi was actually very very polite but it wasn't 
what God wanted from her. Ruth's action was. We can come here week after week after week and we can be polite with one another. We can say the right things and we can uh, put the right mask on and, and we, we, can, we can be polite and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just it doesn't go far enough. And if we quit at being polite, we never actually are kind. For instance, you see somebody crying after the service today, heartbroken. It's polite not to stare. It's polite not to make a big deal out of them. But it's kindness that goes over and sits with them, even if you don't say anything. It's polite not to be rude. Say something rude to somebody. Look at that outfit. Oh my goodness, I can't believe they're wearing that. Okay, let's, hey, how are you? I'm going to be polite and not say anything. It's, it's kindness, however, to seek their best, to do what is best for them. It's polite not to react when somebody says something mean against you. But it's kindness that continues to seek their benefit their welfare, that continues to love them no matter what. This is what we are meant to be. This is what is meant to characterize us as the people of God. Not just politeness, kindness. That whoever walks through these doors, church member, not a church member, looks like us, doesn't look like us, from this nation, not from this nation, believer, not a believer, whoever walks through these doors, they would be overwhelmed by the kindness of God toward each other and toward them in this place. How do we do that? How do we give that love to one another? That goes back to our first application point. Press into God's kindness toward you in Christ. Your sins, believer, have been forgiven. You are cleansed. You are wanted and desired by the Lord of the universe who came here and made every provision necessary for you to be right with him. And as a believer, you are right with God now, not because of you, but because of Christ. This is why we sing. This is why we rejoice here. We do this for his glory, but it is also a reminder that's right, this is why I'm saved. This is what he has done for me. And then, after rejoicing and resting in his kindness toward us, giving him thanks for his continued provision and kindness toward us, we share that same kindness with others. I want to encourage you to do that today. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for your son. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for your kindness toward us in Christ. Thank you that while we were undeserving, you came for the undeserving. Thank you for those who had sinned against you. You came for those who had sinned against you. Thank you that even though we're not worthy now, and as we sang earlier, we know our hearts are prone to wander. We feel it. Your kindness doesn't leave us, doesn't forsake us, holds on to us, and is the solid rock on which we stand. Lord, I want to pray for those that do not know you here in this service today. And I, I pray that in your kindness, as we read even just this morning, that you would lead them to repentance, back to you, to trust in you, Lord Jesus, as their Lord and Savior. Lord, do in this time, in our hearts, what only you can do. And we pray for this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's stand.